You know, it, it really can. It really can be profound. How, when, when we listen to a given piece of music at the volume level we have selected, how that changes the way we experience that music. There's a lot to this. I know it seems so simple. Steve, why are you making a video about a volume control? Because I don't think we think about what we can do with, with the volume control, other than turn it up or turn it down, right? But I mean, how it changes the way we experience music. That's what this is about. And if you think about it, it has nothing to do with how humble your system is, how exalted it is, your room. It's, it's right there. We all have it with headphones, with speakers. We choose the level that we're going to listen to music. And turning it up just a little tiny bit or down a little bit it can really change the way a string quartet sounds or heavy metal sounds or funk sound. It all sounds different. We experience it in a different way when we turn it up and when we turn it down. I, ha I have at times been so obsessive about volume level, how loud I listen to a given piece of music, I would write the volume level down on the LP sleeve or on the CD case. How loud is this song? What's the perfect level? It seemed like an obvious solution. If you have a numerical uh, read out for the volume control, you could, you know, dial it in exactly. This is the way I listened to it two months ago at this level. Now I'm listening to it and I'm going to set it exactly the same level because I have determined through painstaking listening, this is the perfect level. But it doesn't actually work because it's not even the level as in the readout on the volume control. Other, other factors are at play in terms of how loud we would want to listen to a given piece of music the ambient noise level, uh, you know, uh, how we f we're feeling at that moment. Do I have a headache? Uh, all these things would change the way or how loud I would want to listen. So it isn't static. It's not always going to be the same. It's something when you sit down and consciously adjust the volume control. Maybe you're going to adjust it so you want to listen at the level that if this music was being performed in front of you, you would play it as loud as that might be. It's a mental game. It's not a literal thing, right? It's like, this is how loud I think a violin in my room would sound. This is how loud a drum kit would sound in this room. Whatever. Again, you're, you're making a guess there. But there is a, there's a window in which it would be appropriate would be close to how that would sound in the room, right? And that would probably be fairly loud, so you wouldn't be listening that way probably late at night. But the point is, I, I, I think this video, the purpose of this video is to just raise your awareness, your consciousness of how, how loud it is changes the way you feel about it, that's all. Then there's the question of, dynamic range. And that's where this question of setting a, a specific volume level gets a little complicated. Well, put it this way, it gets complicated if the music is pretty dynamic. But if it's a typical piece of compressed music that doesn't get louder, it doesn't get softer, it stays pretty much even from beginning to the end of the song, that's easy. Right? That's a pretty easy thing to do. You, you, you could set it, and if you took out your sound pressure level meter and it was, let's say, 80 dB, that's medium-ish loud, uh, fine. You're, you're playing it and it never really dropped below 78. It never really went above 82, 83. That's the way it would work with a piece of compressed music. But if you then said, you know, I want to listen to this. It's got some life to it. I want some real dynamics. And I set the average level at 80, back to setting at 80, but the really quiet parts got down to 57, 56, 55, and then the really loud parts were up there at 90, 92. Hmm, that's going to be interesting because when it gets really quiet, you go, man, I, I can barely hear it. I gotta, I want to turn it up. And then when it gets really loud, it's like blowing you away because it's so freaking loud. That's. <laughs> That's part of the reason that people don't like very dynamic music because it's getting loud and it's getting quiet, it's getting loud and it's getting quiet. They want it to be eh, fairly consistent from beginning to end. 
hence <laughs> the reason that dynamic range compression happens in the first place is that desire for an evenness of sound level, sound pressure level. So, yeah. But some audiophile labels like Chesky and MA Recording and Maple Shade and Reference Recording, they make music that tends to be either not compressed at all or minimally compressed, and it has loud parts and soft parts. Not exclusive to audiophile labels, it's just more common on audiophile labels. And actually, older music, music recorded in the 60s and 70s and 80s, tended to be less compressed than music is today, and therefore has more quiet parts and medium parts and loud parts to a given recording. And setting a level there, uh, certainly for background listening, gets more complicated. But for listening listening, well, it's more enjoyable because the music sounds more like it does in real life. Hmm. But let's just talk about it back in the general sense of setting the volume level. I, I'm still really hung up on this idea of as I'm listening, I'm tuning it, I'm tuning it, and then I go, yeah, this is, this is where I want it to be. And a dB or two less, eh, it feels like it needs something. Turning it up a little bit more, a little too much, oh, now it's like hitting me too hard, I want to turn it down. And I find that happy place in the middle where it's the Goldilocks and Three Bears thing. It's not too loud, it's not too soft, it's just right. I love that. I mean, before there was recorded music, before there were electronics, uh, to you know audio systems to play it music was the level it was right it just was live music was live music you could ask if you were in control you could ask musicians to play a little more quietly or ask them to play a little louder but it's not the same thing as just with the flick of a wrist getting the exact volume you want to listen at we take it for granted it's so ubiquitous it's just there we can always control it when we're listening to recorded music at home or on the go and I think that that's an amazing control that we have over music that never really existed before. And, uh, you know, I, I did a video years ago, I think, or I wrote about it, of actually listening at quieter and quieter and quieter levels because the quieter you listen, you, you're kind of leaning in, you're paying more attention to the music. When it's hitting you really hard, it's just... It's just there, it becomes part of the, the space, right? But when you listen quietly, just as an exercise, if nothing else, you listen quieter and quieter and quieter, and it just draws you in. It's, it's a fun experiment to, to do. So here's another example of this. I, I, I heard about this, this musician, a classical musician, solo piano recital, and he asked the audience to just chill, basically like, don't just close your eyes and meditate. Just clear your head and don't say anything. Don't check your devices for five minutes. I just want to clear the air. I want to clear the palate, so to speak, and hear silence for five minutes. He said, for myself, the musician, I'm asking you to do that. And for you, the audience, just open your ears and listen to nothing. Just try not to think at all. And then, at the appropriate time, he started to play. And someone who went to this concert said, this was a wonderful thing to do, to just l listen to silence and meditate, breathe, and then the music starts. And she said, you just hear it in a different way. You're more open to it. Your, your brain isn't racing. Uh, checking your devices and stuff before the show starts. And that's part of it. That silence before you listen, or as close as you can get to silence, not always easy here in Brooklyn, but getting as close to silence, or at least clearing your head before you listen, is a very interesting exercise. And you will find, having done it myself, that you will listen at a quieter than average level than you would have otherwise. Because you're, you're more receptive to music at that point. Now, of course, some people, <laughs> some people 
want to, where possible, listen as loud as they can stand or as loud as their system can play without distorting or whatever, right? They want to feel it. They want to have a visceral experience of listening to music. It's a whole body experience. And I did that when I was young. I like listening really loud. But the older I get, the quieter I tend to listen. And uh, I think that's true for a lot of people my age or even considerably younger than me that the loudest seems to be more of a thing for younger people. When I say young, I mean like teenagers and people in their 20s or something and maybe early 30s. But by the time most people are in their early 30s, they would be in that category of, of wanting to listen at a quieter level than they used to. It's an interesting phenomenon about aging. So, loudness, how loud you want to listen, is, is just worthy of some time and thought of where you want to be in that spectrum, so to speak, of soft to loud listening. Of course, I guess a healthy diet uh, relating to food would be, uh, sometimes I want to listen quietly, sometimes medium, sometimes really, really loud. Well, that works too. It's basically about being aware of it. How loud do you want to listen? Or how quietly do you want to listen? What do you think? <laughs> Is this much ado about nothing? Just, hey, turn it up and feel good and move on? Or do you want to actually think about it? Tell me. Tell me in the comments. My name is Steve Guttenberg. This continues to be the Audiophiliac Daily Show. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel. If you already have, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, you could also check out the Patreon while you're being aware and open to new ideas. Check out my Patreon at p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash audiophiliac. There is definitely a link to that below. Uh, but as I always say, or frequently say, while you're here, you could check out the playlist. There's playlists for speaker reviews and headphone reviews and electronics reviews and definitely music reviews. Although I am sort of incorporating music reviews into the gear reviews lately, and I intend, well, probably that, that seems to be working well for a lot of people. So fewer and fewer separate music reviews unless there's a need to do a separate music review. Most of my music reviewing will be incorporated into gear reviews, I think. We'll stick with that for a while, see how that all plays out over time. And I have to also mention once or twice that I do a lot of interviews on this channel. And you know the one I did recently with Christopher Hildebrand, in case you missed that one, who owns Fern and Roby. He makes his own stuff under the Fern and Roby brand, and he also makes products for other people like Linear Tube Audio and Devor Fidelity. Um, I think that was a really interesting conversation. I don't like to think of my interviews as interviews. They're really more about conversations. So hope you enjoy them. So check out the Christopher Hildebrand interview, and I will link to it right there. Uh, the interview I did with John DeVore uh, a few years ago in his factory, and uh, John is uh, the thinking man's uh, audio designer. <laughs> How should I put that? He just, he's a thinker. It, uh, I, I'm so impressed with him. I like his speakers. And I really like John as a person. Uh, I've known him long before he was a manufacturer. He used to work at Sound by Singer. Actually, he was, he arrived at Sound by Singer after I left Sound by Singer, like maybe within six months of me leaving, he came. Maybe there was a reason for that. But anyway, um, John's a great guy. He, his factory is in Brooklyn here at the former Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, just a really interesting man. And I think with that, I can say my work here is at last complete. Thank you again for watching. I hope to see you back here again very, very soon. Bye-bye.